called Jonah. And as we look at the life of Jonah, we're going to see the hard heart of Jonah juxtaposed against the backdrop of God's unrelentless grace and mercy. The title of today's sermon is this, It's Not About the Fish. Now, some of you may be familiar with the book of Jonah. Maybe you have some idea that it has something to do with this fairy tale fish or fairy tale whale. And I just thought the best way to hit that right on the head is to title my sermon, It's Not About the Fish, because it's not. It's about the grace of God reaching the most unlikely people in the most unlikely places. And it's a message we need today. If you have your Bibles, open up your Bibles to the book of Jonah. If you don't have your Bibles, you don't want to turn on your phone, it's going to be right behind you. If you would like a physical copy of a Bible, if you were born before 1982 and you would like a Bible in your hand, there's some Bibles on the ground there. And if you don't know where Jonah is, You can, that's when I was born, 1982. Um, You can look in the table of contents and find the book of Jonah. I'm going to spend a couple minutes, if it's okay with you, and just read through the whole first chapter in the book of Jonah. Follow along with me and just allow God's word to hopefully encourage and challenge you today. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then their mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will rise and give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more temptuous. And he said to them, pick me up, hurl me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more temptuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, hurled him to the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they were offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish. It's not about the fish. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was left, was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Amen. Jonah is this historical figure that we can read more about, a historical figure during the 8th century B.C. We can read about him and his place in history and Israel's history in the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 14. Maybe you're here today, you, you, you heard God's word, you were looking at God's word, you're reading God's word, and maybe for you it's a little bit hard to kind of accept this as a historical account. 
Maybe it's um, some kind of uh, a, a parable that communicates a spiritual truth. And to be honest, there's a lot of different interpretations of the book of Jonah. And your particular interpretation of the book of Jonah is not a hill that I want to die on. But I do want to share with you maybe just a couple thoughts why my intellectual integrity doesn't feel compromised by seeing this as a historical account. Number one, I believe in the power and the sovereignty of God. I believe that God can and did create the heavens and the earth out of nothing. I do believe that God raised Jesus from the dead after his death and burial three days in the tomb. And having a belief system that sees God as powerful and present in this world, it's not hard for me to believe the account of Jonah. And number two, the author of Jonah doesn't create a lot of fictional or embellished details about the fish. The fish isn't even a main character in the story. The fish isn't talking, the fish isn't flying, the fish isn't doing backflips, there aren't sparkles coming out of the fish. Three verses in the whole book of Jonah are about the fish, and the author of Jonah seems to be recording them as mere fact. But remember, it's not about the fish. Here's our main point, New City Church, for our time together. Here it is, maybe you would want to write this down. The people that we're running away from, God is running after. The people that we're tempted to run away from, God is running after. I want that truth about God and his character to shape us and transform us from the inside out. Just to give us a little bit of a table of contents for where we're going today, three headings today. God speaks, Jonah runs, God saves. God speaks, Jonah runs, God saves. Let's look at our first point today, New City. God speaks. Verse 1 of Jonah 1.1 says this, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. We see in our text that the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and specifically calls Jonah to arise and to go speak a, a message of judgment against the Ninevites. Now, before we talk about that message and its historical context, I just want us to see this, believe this, and rejoice in this. Our God is a speaking God. If you follow the storyline of Scripture, sin and death enter into this world. We find ourselves separated from God. We're running away from God, but God is committed to bringing us back to himself. To accomplish that plan of bringing us back to himself, God enters into a unique relationship with Abraham and then the nation of Israel. God enters this unique relationship with Abraham and then the nation of Israel, and from Israel would come the Savior of the world. Now, what's really important for our purposes to understand the main thrust in the book of Jonah is to understand that Abraham and Israel did not deserve this relationship. They were not like the best people in the world. They were not the good people in the world. And God, no, no, they were evil just like everybody else. But God in his grace and mercy enters into this unique relationship with the nation of Israel. It was like a covenant relationship a marriage relationship. It was this unique relationship where God almost as like the faithful husband pledges himself to the people of Israel. And the people of Israel like kind of resoundingly respond to God saying, God, you're our one true God. We'll be faithful to you. We promise to, to love you with all of our heart, mind, and soul. Now, when Israel was drifting away from God, when they were tempted to kind of run after the things of this world or run after the gods of the other nations, God himself would send a prophet, someone who would speak with his power and his authority. He would speak to the people of Israel that were drifting away from God, and the prophet's role was to call God's people back to God in covenant faithfulness. 
Now, what's really unique about the book of Jonah is that Jonah isn't called to go to the people of Israel. Jonah is called to go to the Ninevites. This was an unprecedented responsibility for one of Israel's prophets. Now, Nineveh was a central city in the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were one of the coolest and most violent people in ancient times. The Assyrians were known for capturing their enemies, cutting off their enemies' legs, cutting off one arm of their enemy, and then shaking the other arm and hand, mocking them while they died. The Assyrians were cold, evil, and wicked. And God calls Jonah to speak against this nation, but wrapped up in this message of judgment is also the opportunity for grace. I want you to hear this. Our God is a speaking God. He wants to guide his people, lead his people, direct his people to the joy-filled life in Jesus. Think about this. God is infinitely transcendent. He's far above us in every way, and yet he lowers himself to speak to us in a way, the infinite communicating to the finite. It's like a PhD professor at UC Berkeley communicating to her three-year-old daughter. The PhD professor could run intellectual circles around the daughter, but she finds it her joy to lower herself and communicate to her daughter in a way that she understands. Come, sit, let's play. Mommy loves you. When she's communicating to her daughter, she's not trying to impress her colleagues at UC Berkeley. She's trying to communicate in a way that her daughter can understand, feel, and comprehend. I want you to hear this, that the transcendent God finds it his joy to communicate to us in a way that we can comprehend. And if God is speaking, the question I have for New City Church, are we listening? I believe that the primary way that God is speaking today is through his word. I don't think it's the only way God is speaking, but if you want to hear God's will for your life most clearly, most directly, on point, God's word is that guide leading us. If God is speaking Through his word, are we listening, New City? If God's word says that he loves us, are you listening to that? If it says that all of your sins have been forgiven in Jesus, they've been washed away, are you listening? That you've been redeemed, you've been made new, you've been made one with Jesus, you've been welcomed into God's family, are you listening? When God's word says for us to love our enemies, are we listening? When God's word says to forgive as we've been forgiving, are we listening? When God says to be generous and ready to share, are we listening? When God says to pursue holiness and sexual morality, are we listening? When God says to go and make disciples of all nations, even the jocks, the nerds, and everybody else in the lunchroom, are we listening? Our God is a speaking God, and his word is the path to the joy-filled life. Amen? Amen. Point number two is that Jonah runs. God is speaking, but Jonah is running in the other direction. Verse two says this, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out it against it. For their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. God calls Jonah to arise and go to Nineveh. But what does Jonah do? He runs and flees. He gets in a boat in Joppa and heads towards Tarshish. Now, the exact location of this city is unknown, but we do know that it was in the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. It was at the very edge of Israel's geographical awareness. Like they couldn't imagine anything beyond it. Jonah is literally running to the end 
of the world. He's running from Nineveh. He's running from God's will for his life. But most significantly, he's trying to run from God. We see the author intentionally three times in chapter one use this phrase, fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And I almost want us to see the comical nature of this attempt. Like, have you ever tried to outrun God? You can't outrun God. It's like a three-year-old trying to play hide-and-seek with their parents. Micah used to love to play hide-and-seek with us, and we would go into the other room, and we would count to 10 or count to 15, and we would say, Micah, where are you? And we would ask, Micah, where are you? Not because we didn't know where Micah was, because Micah was right there, (laughs) just hiding and giggling in plain sight, like right behind the chair in plain sight for everyone to see. But in Micah's mind, he couldn't have found a a more discreet location to hide. Like for him, he was like stowed away in this underground valley. Like I don't know where he was, but he was right there for us to see. You can't flee from the presence of an omnipresent God. You can't flee from the presence of an omnipresent God. However... When we do run, deliberately run from God's will for our lives, God will seem more distant. He's there. He's present. But when it's not our will to do his will, God will seem distant and elusive. The author of Jonah uses a literary technique to highlight this reality. God calls Jonah to arise, to get up, to go. And what does Jonah do? He goes down. He goes down to Joppa, down into the boat, then down into the deeper parts of the boat, and eventually down into the water, symbolizing Jonah's downward descent, this spiral towards chaos and death. Every act of disobedience was a step towards direct destruction. Every act of disobedience was a step towards death. I want us to hear this. Disobedience never leads to flourishing. God wants us to flourish. God wants us to experience the joy-filled life. But when we're deliberately running from God's will for our life, not only will we not flourish, but we won't sense the very presence of God. Now, why was Jonah running to the edges of the known world? The author doesn't tell us until chapter 4. And I want you to be here in week 4, but just in case you're not here in week 4, Jonah 4, verse 3, Jonah actually gives us the answer. This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah flees because hatred has gripped his heart. He knows God is gracious. He knows that God is merciful, and he hates the Ninevites so much If he has anything to do with it, he's going to run in the other direction. He even says, throw me overboard. Remember that? He would rather die than the Ninevites actually experience the grace and the mercy of God. Think about this. Jonah understands that God is gracious and merciful. Like he understands that intellectually. He's just not being transformed by it. He understands that God is gracious and merciful. He can show up at the local seminary and wax eloquently about God's grace and mercy. He can preach about God's grace and mercy, but God's grace and mercy isn't transforming him. Because when God's grace is transforming us, it creates in us this impulse that wants to see other people experience God's grace. New city, did you catch it? When God's grace is transforming us from the inside out. It creates in us this new impulse that desires to see other people 
all those people to experience God's grace and mercy. It's like when we get that perfect bite of dessert, whatever your perfect bite of dessert is. It's warm apple pie. It's strawberry cheesecake. It's triple chocolate, triple layer chocolate chip cake, whatever it is. When you taste the perfect bite of the perfect dessert, your natural impulse is to want to share the perfect bite of the perfect dessert. You push the plate over to the people that you're sitting with. Even in a COVID world, you want to share your spoon and your fork. You want everybody to taste what you're experiencing. Jonah doesn't want to share his God. Jonah doesn't want the Ninevites to taste and experience the grace and the mercy of God because Jonah hasn't been transformed by this grace and mercy. Jonah wants to sit on God's judgment throne with God himself and judge all the evil people of the world. Jonah thinks he's that tight with God, that him and God can just kind of sit on the throne and start judging everybody. What Jonah is failing to see and to realize is that Jonah deserves God's judgment just like everybody else. Gripped by hate, Jonah runs. And I just want to remind us, centuries later, God would send another prophet, his own son. And rather than being gripped by hate, he was gripped by love. And rather than running the other direction, he embraced his mission, he embraced his calling, he embraced death on a cross so that salvation would be secure for people like Jonah and the evil people in Nineveh and even people in the city of Oakland and the East Bay. I'm thankful for not the rebel prophet, but the faithful prophet, Jesus Christ, who comes so that we might have hope, not only in this world, but in the world to come. I pray that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ would be so deeply embedded in our hearts that it begins transforming us from the inside out so that our natural impulse is to want to share that good news with others. Amen? Jonah runs, but God saves. I want you to hear this, believe this, rejoice in a new city. Our God is a saving God. Without compromising his holiness or his justice, our God delights in moving towards the most unlikely and undeserving people and drawing them into his infinite love. Our God is a saving God. Again, Jonah knows intellectually that God is gracious and merciful, and he doesn't want the Ninevites to experience that grace and mercy, so he jumps on a boat and runs in the other direction. Verse 4 says this, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. The, then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. God causes this great wind, and this great storm. Again, I believe in the power and the authority of God. Like, I think God can create everything. I think God can send fish when he wants to send fish. And I think God can create storms if he wants to create storms. Again, Jonah is in the boat with Gentile sailors who worship other gods. And Jonah says, just throw me overboard. I would rather die. Verse 15 says this, or verse 13 says this, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. These were honorable men. They loved Jonah more than Jonah loved Jonah. They were afraid of the storm. They were afraid of what had happened to them on this day. And then eventually they throw Jonah overboard. Think about this. Jonah hates the Ninevites. He, he has no love for Gentiles. He wants to run the other direction. But where does Jonah run? He runs to a boat full of Gentiles who worship other gods. 
And after these Gentile sailors see the presence of the storm and see this storm cease, what happens to these Gentile sailors? They start worshiping God. Verse 15, they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Remember they had feared the wind? Now they're fearing the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Again, think about the irony. Jonah wants to run away from Gentiles. He runs to Gentiles. And now these Gentiles seem to experience the grace and mercy of God. Our God is a saving God. And as your pastor, I just want to remind you that the same God who saves the most unlikely people in the most unlikely places is the same God that is working in our midst today. God hasn't hit a pause on his mission to save people. God delights that the farthest people away from him would actually experience his grace and mercy. I just want to remind us, God is working in the city of Oakland. God is working in our cities, our neighborhoods, our homes. God is working. This is why we think one of the rhythms to the joy-filled life is a life on mission, that God wants to work through us, not as we run from our mission, but as we embrace our mission. Jonah was blinded to the joy, the privilege, the opportunity that he had. Rather than being ruled by love, he was ruled by hate. But the people that Jonah hated, God loved. The people that Jonah was running from, God was running after. May our hearts be conformed to the heart of God so that the people that God loves, we would love. The people that God is running after, we would run after. Like in your theology, is there room in heaven for the people that you dislike and hate? God has made a way for them. God has made room for them. He's preparing a room for them right now. Will we make room for them? Remember, it's not about the fish, but let's look at verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish. That's all it says. It was great. I don't know. It was a good fish. It was a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It's not about the fish, but the fish is a demonstration of God's grace and mercy to Jonah. Even as Jonah is in the spiral descent towards death and destruction, God is there. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you've hit rock bottom. Maybe that's the best place to be. Because right at rock bottom, I just want you to know God is there. He's not turning from you. He's not running away from you. He's there, delighting that you would experience the fullness of his grace and mercy, ready to lift you, ready to rescue you. So if you're running or if you're at rock bottom, I implore you today to look up and just simply receive the grace that God has for you in Jesus Christ. Allow God's grace and mercy to wash over you and to make you new today. New City Church, I love being your pastor. I want to invite the band up at this point. And I hope you're going to commit with being us for the next three or four weeks, four weeks, as we work through the book of Jonah. Just because I read Jonah 4, 3 doesn't mean you don't have to come on the fourth week. There's more in Jonah 4. I hope that we'll see all that God has for us in this book. Remember that junior high lunchroom? Pretty awkward, pretty scary. Even in junior high, this world is divided. Our lives, our stories, our country has been shaped by divisions. Division and division and division. I just want to remind us that there's a new story that's being written today. And it's a story that allows us to overcome. It's a story that allows us to overcome bitterness, 
unforgiveness, anger, and hate. There's a better story being written today, and it's a story of God's grace and mercy to the undeserving. A grace and mercy to us. Grace and mercy that then compels us to share it and give it to others. May that be true of us, New City. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. What seems to be a random book in the Old Testament about this rebel prophet who wants to run away from you and your will. Oh, how there's just rich truth for each and every one of us. But in this book, over and over again, we're going to be introduced to you, a God who is gracious and merciful to the undeserving, saving the most unlikely people in the most unlikely places, Heavenly Father. And we just want to be a people who respond to you in praise because we don't deserve it. We don't deserve what you've given to us, but we want to be a people that are grateful, that are thankful and that live the rest of our lives and all of our lives, every aspect of our lives for your glory. And as we take our eyes off ourselves and as we look to you, may you give us more and more joy, more and more peace, more and more happiness as we don't run from you, Lord, but as we walk with you day in and day out for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.